Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, coming. Um, I'd like to open with just a, a quick Our Father and um, keep, uh, keep the thoughts and prayers for those people in the Middle East right now undergoing the persecution, the Christians, and just in, in general. Um, so, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. So, <laughs> it's just kind of being funny here. Isn't the new world wonderful? <laughs> well, <laughs> when you look at the history of it, you'll find out it it uh, it wasn't as wonderful as it as it appears. Um, a lot of priests accompanied various expeditions uh, seeking to bring uh, native peoples to Christ. Um, it was generally supported by the Spanish crown. Surprisingly, um, a lot of the abuses, you, know, you hear about the conquistadors, um, which I'll be talking about, um, abuses were, were by the, the people that wanted to um, <clears throat> gain their own power while they were over here, which was kind of contradictory. Um, so the missionaries themselves um, would learn the native traditions and dialects and train uh, a lot of the Indians in agriculture and uh, technical skills. And that's, you know, basically the main ways that they would win uh, converts to the faith. So first I I'm going to talk about um, Hernando Cortez, um, who encountered the Aztecs. Um, contrary to popular belief, uh, slavery was not the invention of Western civilization. Um, uh, it was part of the depravity of the human condition that really traces back to, I think, the stain of original sin. So it is, it is Western civilization which brought Christianity that was really the instrument to overcome uh, slavery, slavery and abuses that were in the New World. So, um, Cortez uh, landed in Mexico in 1519, uh, which seemingly to fulfill an Aztec prophecy. Uh, Cortez en uh, encountered an Indian girl named Marina, who agreed to act as an interpreter for Cortez and learned of the intense hatred in the, uh, <coughs> of the brutal Aztecs for, for most of the native populations. Cortez aligned himself with the local Indian tribes to conquer the Aztecs. So the Aztecs were kind of a warrior people and they had taken a lot of other native Indian Americans as sl slaves. So Cortez marched into um, the city called, uh, see if I can get this right, Tenochtitlan, with great pomp and circumstance as a result of knowing the prophecy. So he learned this from the Indian girl. So fearing that Montezuma would attack and distrustful of the ambush, Cortez captured Montezuma. And uh, so he basically was conquering and growing in power and the, uh, fearing this, the governor of Cuba, um, sent soldiers to the Aztec capital to arrest Cortez. Uh, the soldiers actually wound up joining Cortez and upon returning to the capital found the Aztecs in rebellion. Uh, they were enraged by the human sacrifices while uh, Cortez was away. So there was a Spanish contingency left behind and they witnessed the human sacrifices and they were so enraged by this that they started um, attacking the, the Aztecs. 
So Cortes swooped in to help the Spaniards, and while fighting his way out, Montezuma was killed by his own people, and a number of Spaniards were captured. So then Cortes eventually regrouped. He built a small fleet of ships for because uh, Mexico. There's a big lake around Mexico City, which is where the uh, let's try this again. Tenochtitlan it was basically um, the predecessor to Mexico City. So he built this fleet of ships and attacked with 600 men, and he was allied with 5,000 uh, Indians, um, warriors that were not Aztecs. So aided by an outbreak of smallpox, which decimated the population of Aztecs, Cortes recaptured the capital, um, and afterwards, with money from the crown, he had 12 Franciscans come in to evangelize the Aztec capital. Um, so that's what that's the fate of the Aztecs. So down in uh, South America, there were the the Incas, and they had a, a pretty strong empire. And so there's a man named uh, Francisco Pizarro. He sounds Italian. <clears throat> uh, Pizarro went to South America and visited the city of Tambez which is in a northern, today, the northern Peruvian, uh, uh, it, the capital of Peru. Um, he was accompanied by a few men, uh, and impressed by the wealth of the Inca Empire, uh, he returned to Spain um, to muster more men, and basically he was looking for conquest as well. So he returned to find the Incas embroiled in a civil war where he was able to take full advantage. So the kingdom, the Inca kingdom was politically divided and he entered the heart of the empire and was welcomed by Alta Hulapa, another one I can't pronounce too well, the son of Huanya Capac, who claimed the right of the throne. The emperor attempted to awe Pizarro with wealth and majesty, and he invited him to his resort in the Andes. Fearing a trap, Pizarro invited Alta Hulupa, boy, this is, this is hard, <laughs> to the Spanish camp instead. The emperor went unarmed with pomp and ceremony and many unarmed nobles. The emperor greatly misjudged Pizarro, and he killed most of the nobles and, and captured um, Alta Hualpa. The emperor offered much gold and silver for ransom, and Pizarro did not accept, uh, accept or believe this. Still fearing the emperor, Pizarro eventually tried, tried him and executed him for killing the Quanto, uh, Quido Indians at uh, Cusco. <coughs> So not much was really noted here um, in the way of missionary purpose, um, but I think it's noteworthy um, to say that uh, conquering and war was not introduced by the New World or by Western civilization. The wars and conquering were going on for centuries among the indigenous peoples prior to when any Westerners arrived. You know, again, I think this falls back to the depravity of the human condition, which is uh, basically comes from the stain of the original sin. So, um, unlike I think a, what a lot of modern history wants to teach is, you know, we we came and attacked these great Indian cultures. Well, these great Indian cultures were were basically not as pristine, as innocent as um, they might, you know, lead you to believe today. So Spanish rule in the Americas. <clears throat> so Spanish conquistadors crisscrossed the American continents. Um, these are these are just a few of them. There was a uh, uh, Ponce de Leon explored Florida for the Fountain of Youth. I tried it myself, but I I couldn't find it either. Um, <clears throat> Hernando de Soto pushed into Mississippi. Um, person by uh, Francisco de Coronado led a group from Mexico to Kansas. So can you believe it? The Spanish were in Kansas before 
Dorothy was or the Many native tribes involved human sacrifice and gruesome uh, rituals. Many missionaries had trouble with natives in the examples of the conquistadors. So it was very difficult to convert the native peoples, um, mainly the influence of the medicine men and their superstitions um, were against the missionaries of the New World. And then, of course, the bad example of the Spanish coming in and conquering. It's not exactly probably a good Christian witness when you just come in and sort of conquer and slaughter people. You know, it doesn't really make you that much different than uh, what you're stopping. So interestingly enough, um, it was the main objective of many priests and bishops to defend the rights of the Indian peoples. So the church did much to promote native rights. In 1512, Bartol Bartol Bartolome de las Casas helped the Spanish king pass what's called the Laws of Burgos, which protected the Indians. And then there's uh, Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros and Pope Adrian VI urged the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V to treat the Indians of the New World with Christian charity. So the church was really trying to do what they could to treat the native peoples with, with uh, respect and dignity. And um, so th thank, uh, thank the Lord for the church. Um, by the way, the, uh, <clears throat> the popes, these same popes of this time were also the popes of the Reformation. Um, during the Protestant Rebellion. So while that was taking place in Europe, all this was going on in the New World. Uh, for example, Pope Paul III was one of the major um, forebearers of the Council of Trent, and he was uh, a, a great pope who was converted uh, later in life. He had a late life conversion, and that was mentioned in one of the previous talks. I don't know if you recall that. So the Rulers of Spain protected the natives by making all Indians vassals of the crown. That's something else they tried to do. Um, and then there was a, a bishop in Mexico, Juan de Zumaraga. The first bishop of Mexico uh, tried to found schools for the Indians and universities to promote further educational opportunities. You'll hear a little bit more about him coming up. So, uh, <clears throat> Our Lady of Guadalupe. So, it takes, uh, it takes the Blessed Mother to uh, really uh, break down the barriers and, I think, impact uh, 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 people, bringing people to Christianity. So, um, <clears throat> here's how she intervened. And I think this is a, a beautiful story. I think most of us know about the uh, Lady of Guadalupe, but I don't know how many people understand the, how the story goes. So this, um, <clears throat> so there was a in native Indian, uh, St. Juan Diego, um, who was canonized by Pope John Paul II and had a vision of Mary on December 9th, 1531. Um, so <clears throat> Juan Diego on December 9th, 1531, 10 years after Cortez, received a vision of the Blessed Virgin on his way to Mass. The Blessed Mother asked Juan to go to the bishop and ask him to build a church to be erected in her name. The bishop, Juan de Zumaraga, listened patiently to Juan Diego but was quite skeptical. Unknown to Juan, the bishop was going through his own struggles with how to deal with the natives since the Spanish rule was so bloody and cruel. He feared a revolt from the Indians, and he prayed earnestly and also asked that the Lord would give him a sign of roses from his hometown of Castile in Spain. So that's, that's kind of interesting. So Juan Diego <clears throat> went home feeling like he failed Mary. 
So Mary appeared again that evening to Juan and asked him to go to the bishop a second time. Upon visiting the second time, the bishop asked Juan Diego to give a sign to prove the veracity of her visitation. Juan Diego returned home once again disappointed. On December 12th, Juan Diego's uncle became very ill. Fearing that he may die, Juan summoned a priest to give him last rites. Because of the urgency, Juan tried to detour around the hill where Mary first appeared to him, but it made no difference. Mary appeared to him. Juan spoke of the illness of his uncle, and Mary reassured him of his recovery. The Blessed Mother directed Juan to a nearby hill where roses would be found out of season, and he would bring them to the bishop as a sign. Juan gathered a bunch of roses in his tilma. Tilma is a, um, a cloak made out of cactus hair, and brought them to the bishop. When Juan Diego let down his tilma with the roses, there appeared a miraculous picture of the Blessed Mother on Juan's tilma. The bishop immediately fell to his knees and eventually realized that Mary's image was printed on the tilma. The miracle prompted the bishop to build the church. So I, I think that was kind of fascinating because it's, it's really, uh, you think about Juan Diego, but it was an answer to the bishop's prayer who was, was really struggling and he had asked the Lord to give him a sign. And I think obviously Juan Diego had no idea because the, the bishop had kept this private. Beautiful story. So the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is a message to all Americas. In the image, Mary appeared greater than the sun, moon, and stars, and pagan deities, yet she was bowing in submission. She herself was not a god, the image seemed to say, but she prayed to the one true God. The cross around Mary's neck was the same that was on Cortez's flag, and through this image the Indians began to embrace the Catholic faith. Uh, ten million Americans were converted to the Catholic faith over the next ten years, and human sacrifice in Mexico ended forever. So Our Lady of Guadalupe today, <clears throat> she's still embraced today after 450 years. Her image uh, has expressed protection of Our Lady of the Americas, and she's officially the patroness of the Americas. And her feast day is December 12th in the Universal Church. So a couple of interesting things about the, uh, the tilma. Um, it was uh, with child, for she wore an Aztec maternity belt. That's, that's what indicates that, I think, I don't know if anyone's heard this, but they believe that um, it's the only um, picture or image of our Blessed Lady where she's uh, with child. And, and that's how they determine it, because she's wearing the Aztec maternity belt. In addition, there was four petal flower over the womb, which was a special symbol of life, uh, movement, and deity. This is why it is believed that the image depicts the Blessed Mother as obviously with child, with Jesus in her womb, obviously. So this is one reason why the Tilma image is a strong representation of the pro-life movement today. Uh, I think it's only fitting for this since abortion originated in America. Uh, modern scientific studies have been done on the tilma um, with infrared photography and digital enhancement techniques. They've concluded that the method that employed the image is unknown. There's no brush strokes, uh, no tracing of an image or, or anything that they can account for, for it to get on the tilma. They couldn't find any dye or paint as well. Uh, there's another interesting thing uh, about it is there was a um, a triple reflection. So they, when they enhance the eye 
of the Telma, they can actually see a reflection of a man with a beard in the eye, which is believed to be Juan Diego, which I thought was kind of fascinating. Um, anyway, millions of pilgrims continue to travel today to uh, the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in uh, Mexico City. Okay, the Spanish missions um, tried to create communities away from settlers. Um, there were 32 mission settlements established between 1610 and 1767. Um, 21 California missions, and they ministered to over 700,000 neophyte Catholics. So basically um, what some of these missionaries did is they wanted to create settlements away from the conquistadors, away from the Spanish at the time, because so they could focus on them without their involvement. And they had two priests and four laymen assigned to each community. They transcribed spoken and native languages uh, into written languages, taught reading, writing, and modern farming techniques and industrial crafts. Uh, notable names are Blessed Junipero Serra, responsible for 21 missions in California. And nine missions and collaborators and 12 more after his death. Um, and then there were, again, slavery. Um, uh, slavery and St. Peter Claver. Um, the Portuguese, like the Arabs, brought slaves to Northern Europe in the 16th century the Dutch and English eventually dominated the slave trade, bringing thousands <clears throat> to the New World colonies. Um, so St. Peter Claver traveled to Cartagena, Colombia in 1610 and spent a life dedicated to helping and treating slaves with dignity. Now, he wasn't able to end slavery, but he, he still dedicated his life to, to caring and, and helping them as much as he could. Um, so the horrors of the, the trade were well documented. Uh, travel was extremely hazardous and many slaves perished during the journeys. Families suffered as husbands, wives, and children were separated. So St. Peter Claver, who again landed in Cartagena in 1610, uh, which uh, Cartagena was the chief slave market at the time, and St. Claver was appalled at the harsh and inhumane treatment of the African slaves and decided to devote his life to their care. Um, so he did this for 40 years in, in, in an attempt to temper the evils of slavery. So he cared for the sick, um, um, tended to their sores, offered kind words of support uh, to wounded victims of the trade. He also instructed them in the Catholic faith after they arrived and were waiting to be traded. He is known to have baptized 300,000 slaves while in Cartagena. So he declared himself the slave of the Negroes forever, and his feast day is September 9th. And, uh, and again, the church... Um, was the defender of human rights and dignity. And again, Pope Paul III, who reigned 1534 to 1549, wrote um, what's called the Sublimus Deus, or Sublime God, and it's basically um, a, an encyclical condemning slavery. Um, so the, you know, the Indians, were they were looked at as lacking in the Catholic faith, and they were treated like animals, and they were used to satisfy the avarice of those who enslaved them. And so he really spoke out against them and uh, condemned uh, the act of slavery. So now <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the French missionary activity in North America. This is where it gets kind of real juicy. 
Um, the French colonized North America in the 17th century, and basically there were many French trappers that lived among the Huron Indians, and they established trading posts from St. Lawrence uh, down to New Orleans, down the Mississippi. Um, Jesuit missionaries uh, accompanied the trappers, and their success was pretty limited. Um, um, and the missionaries persevered in the faith and sanctity to the point of martyrdom. And I'll talk about a couple of them. St. John de Brebeuf, a Jesuit missionary, traveled to New France in 1625 and worked among the Huron Indians for 16 years. And he, very brilliant, uh, educated uh, person, he fluently learned the Huron, Huron language and at uh, one point war broke out between the Iroquois and Hurons and um, St. John Brebeuf was captured and he was martyred in 1649 along with five other Jesuits um, which was pretty gruesome. Um, he was made a baptismal mockery by having boiling water poured on his head and then having a red-hot poker shoved down his throat. Through the whole ordeal, St. John never cried out in pain and suffered in silence. The name of the Native American sport of lacrosse was to have first been coined by St. Brebeuf. Again, I think this, this also underscores, again, that war, violence, and destruction were not a product of the arrival of Western culture. Again, it boils down to the stain of original sin and the depravity of man. If anything, Western culture um, brought civ uh, civilized, civilization and order to the new world. St. Isaac Joguet. Traveled uh, um, to New France in 1625, joined St. John Brebeuf at Lake Huron, and he was captured by the Iroquois on 1642 and forced into slavery for 13 months. Um, he was rescued and returned to France, um, and he wound up returning back to the New World. God bless him. Um, and he was uh, looking to broker a truce between the uh, Hurons and the Iroquois. Uh, unfortunately, um, bl uh, blight broke out and affected the crops, and the Indians blamed uh, St. Isaac Joguet um, for sorcery, and they wound up beating him to death with a tomahawk. Um, and... Uh, so he met his demise as a, as a martyr as well. And he has a, uh, the feast day of St. Brebeuf and St. Joguet and all the other North American martyrs is celebrated on October 19th. So the last, uh, last one I'm going to talk about is the founding of the Catholic colony in Maryland. And I think this, uh, this is a good story. The, the English Catholics came to the New World to escape fierce persecution. So over in Europe, there was uh, Henry VIII, and there was, um, after him, um, Elizabeth, who reigned, Bloody Mary. And so there was a lot of persecution in England, and so many Catholics were coming to the New World to escape. So they established a colony in Maryland under Lord Baltimore, George Calvert. Catholics and Protestants initially lived in peace there. Protestants started out to outnumber the Catholics, and uh, things got a little bit, started to get a little bit dicey. So some Protestants did not think, um, let's see, excuse me a second. 
Now, as Protestant numbers increased in Maryland, Catholics began to suffer restrictions on their religious freedom. Some Protestants did not think that, uh, the, uh, sorry, I, I neglected one thing. There was, so what was created to try and um, keep the peace between the Protestants and the Catholics was what's called the Charter of Toleration. And some Protestants did not think, uh, so they uh, did not think the Charter of Toleration went far enough um, to protect the English Catholics. So but there was basically sort of two groups of Protestants here. So there's the, there's the Protestants that were sort of against the Catholics, and then there was a group that was in defense of them. Um, so in order to protect the Catholic minority in Maryland, the colonial representative legislature was split into two parts. Uh, this precedent would eventually influence the establishment of a bicameral, which is a two-house legislature, uh, specified in the Constitution of the United States. So Maryland and Pennsylvania, which was mainly Quakers, became a bastion al of allowing anyone to practice any Christian religion. So non-establishment of religion eventually became enshrined in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So John Carroll of Baltimore was appointed the first Catholic bishop in the United States shortly after the Revolution. And Bishop Carroll was the brother of one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So see, our Catholics, we had our hand in it. Okay, now for the questions. Do I get angry with people who disagree with me in matters of faith? Do I truly have compassion and concern towards those I try to express my faith to? Do I love the other person or am I just trying to get my point across? If I have won an argument or debate, have I truly witnessed? Okay, so uh, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, time to go ponder the questions. Thank you.